thank you again, uh, Richard Gilman Opowski. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I first just want to thank all of you for being here. Um, and I want to thank uh, Andrew and Chris for organizing this event. And I think, uh, you know, I've been feeling for a very long time that we need to talk in the United States about revolution. We need to talk about insurrection. And so I need to thank you for making this possible, not just in terms of an event, but for making this, and when I say you now, I mean the occupation movement, not just here, but across the country and outside of the country in solidarity. Because you can't just, if you want to talk about revolution and insurrection, one can't just go and have the conversation. Um, something has to happen. So I thank you for making this possible in a psychic way. I thank you for making this possible by creating a space where you don't actually have to begin with a long argument as to why we are talking about revolution. Now, the, uh, the, the comments that I want to make, I'm hoping will be um, half or less than half as long as the open discussion that we'll have. I mean, that's um, my understanding of the purposes of this, of this evening. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my work on the question of revolution and insurrection in relation to the occupations. And my remarks are going to come mainly from an article that's going to be published in April of 2012. So actually, you know, when, when you publish an article in a journal, you, you hope that this many people read it, you know, but, uh, and, and oftentimes that is not as much a hope as a delusion. But, uh, but so I'm very happy um, to, to sort of have, a, have a testing ground for, for some of what I say there. The article is, uh, is, some, is, is going to be published some, in a place you all should know about. It's coming out in a journal called Left Curve that's been around since 1974. Um, and you should check out, uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, uh, leftcurve.org, where they have a lot of their uh, old articles and current articles. And the title of the article is The Eternal Recurrence of Insurrection. And it gets a sort of strange inspiration from an unlikely place from a German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, and I'll explain how that inspiration comes through toward the end. But the way I begin is by thinking about some of the ways that revolution has been thought about in the history of philosophy. And people have been thinking about revolution and what it means for a very long time. And so in the article, I begin with what I call a fragmentary constellation of thought on revolution, and I look at Marx's conception of revolution, which isn't that different than Edmund Burke's conception of revolution when Burke was writing about the revolution in France. Uh, strangely, in the U.S., at the same time that Marx was writing about revolution was Henry David Thoreau, who wrote about something called a peaceable revolution that didn't look like anything that was called revolution in a classical sense. I review the anarchist conception of revolution as it came through the works of Pierre Joseph Proudhon and Enrico Malatesta, and also touch briefly on some more contemporary theories of revolution from people like Michel Foucault, Enrique Dussel. Not for our purposes, any reason why you would need to know those names. You may or you may not, but it's not necessary for our purposes that you do. At the end of the review, though, I, I, I dare a general formulation. I, I, I want to make a general formulation, and it's something like this. Revolution consists of the diverse processes of the radical transformation of the existing state of affairs, working from what is toward what ought to be. So revolution consists of processes 
of a radical transformation of the existing state of affairs, working from what is toward what ought to be. And this is kind of a least common denominator definition. It draws on all of the different thinkers I mentioned briefly. Quickly, the question comes, who's going to answer what ought to be? Who decides what ought to be? What, what the better, better possible future that we all should be working toward would look like? And the problem gets harder when you ask revolutionaries, and hopefully some are in the room. When you ask revolutionaries, you know they give you different answers, that revolutionaries don't all have the same sense of what ought to be. Some revolutionaries have no answer to the question at all um, because, you know, they have seen a long line of men with answers of how things will look after the revolution. And those men the 20th century has told us oftentimes turn out to be the most dangerous ones, the ones that we probably should be more suspicious of than excited about. Some revolutionaries only know that the present state of affairs is immoral. It is intolerable and that it must be opposed. And the first thing I want to suggest is that we should never take for granted the importance of a moral condemnation of the existing state of affairs because it is not something that you can just take for granted. It is not everywhere around you. It is not always the case that everyone makes a moral condemnation of the existing state of affairs. So when you start to see one emerge, don't get so worried so quickly that there isn't some shared vision of how it ought to be. In some cases as well, even in the streets of actual upheavals, the participants themselves will give different answers side by side, which is of course what happened in Tahrir Square in Egypt. And then you have these very dishonest uh, revolutionaries sometimes, th some of those who write for the International Socialist Review. Every time they look at a a, a, any kind of revolutionary foment, of course, for them, it means that they all oppose capitalism, which is a kind of a bit of wishful thinking, but not incredibly honest. Instead of faulting diverse revolutionary aspirations for failing to unanimously identify an ideal end state, I think we can defend revolution as an open-ended process of transformation that can address its own failures through further transformation. Revolutionary activity doesn't require any agreement on an ideal end state. There has been a contention uh, which I want to oppose now, and I think everyone in the room will be familiar with it. And that is the short-sighted and reactionary demand that the Occupy Wall Street movement and those who occupy in solidarity should say exactly what they want and should articulate a specific platform for the consideration of those in positions of power. Liberals who are listening and want to know what we demand so that they can gratify our demands. Something like this. Uh, well, the anxiety surrounding this frustrated expectation, I think, can be given some expression. Those watching the occupations want the occupiers to establish a dialogue with power holders, which would reassure the relationship of the occupiers to power holders in a familiar and paternalistic way. The rebellious child, for example, in a clear standoff with the mother or father. But, but specific demands would reduce complexity making the occupations not only easier for those in the media to discuss, but easier for them to be dismissed. I also think it's worth noting that making a specific demands and creating some kind of a platform or agenda for the occupations is for us, I think, dishonest. Because if we really mean 99%, then we cannot enumerate some kind of cohesive agenda on a short piece of paper. If we really mean 99% and if we really want to 
our response to the claims of isolation by bringing in more participants, then we should be weary about the demand, now no longer on the outside, now on the inside of the occupations, to specify an agenda, to enumerate demands, because once you start enumerating those demands, many with sympathies will turn away, and we will make a moment of dishonesty that is egregious, because there is no 99% of any population that has such a cohesive psyche. Now, uh, if the uh, child, for example, demands a higher weekly allowance, the request can be rejected as inappropriate. You know, as a father of a four-year-old, I see how easy this works for me. You know, I say, what do you want? He gives me a specific thing, and then I can say whether it is true or not. Uh, that's not the time. It's not the time for that. Is there really no time to play Legos? No, of course, any time is okay to play Legos. But you give me a specific demand and I can address it. But if the child expresses general unhappiness with the basic features and arrangements of her home life, then the parents are placed at a loss. Unspecified disaffection, generalized disaffection is real. And it creates an impasse for the conciliatory efforts of power. It is very difficult to placate. It is very difficult to reconcile a complex aversion that nobody can diagnose. So I want to celebrate the, the absence of an agenda. And I want to speak about it in the context of revolution, which I want to move toward in a moment. The occupiers, many of us, we know why we should continue to respond to the invitation for a particular agenda with a kind of joyful silence. Because many of us, we can see that generalized disaffection cannot be refuted. You know, people want to make arguments against the occupation. But how do you make an ideological argument against generalized disaffection? You cannot make an ideological, nor can you make a logical argument against generalized disaffection. It is also clear, and we mustn't forget this, that the recommendations to articulate a platform originally came from outside, and that the presence of an internal impetus for enumerated demands, I think, mainly reflects an interest in gratifying external criticisms. Of course, within the occupations, there are also liberal and conservative tendencies, which obviously, outside of the occupations, have not been very satisfying, because if liberal and conservative tendencies were, there would have been no occupations. We cannot predict how things will go, whether or not the occupations will take on a more insurrectionary turn, or whether or not these energies will be channeled into procedural politics in the election cycle. My fear, uh, and I, I have no reason to think it will definitely happen, but my fear is that the energies that bring you here, the energies that bring you to drop a banner, um, the energies that bring people into the streets to occupy bank lobbies, that those energies will be channeled into an election cycle. That is my fear. I don't think, however, that even if this happens, and if the occupations seem to dissipate and go away for some time, that their reemergence is unlikely. In fact, I think that these occupations are already a reemergence of earlier energies. Okay? I think these occupations are themselves, they did not begin on Wall Street, okay? and they did not begin in the Arab Spring. There were occupations in 2008 in Greece that have not stopped in response to that crisis. There were occupations in 1968 in France. There were occupations in 1968 in the United States. And I have to say that I, I don't downplay the importance of this moment for us historically because it is the first time since 1968 that for months on end, people in this country are talking about capitalism. 
And we need to have a conversation not only about revolution, but we need to have a conversation about capitalism. Those who are asking with feigned concern for the purposes of the occupations will never be gratified with a clear answer. They don't even want one. They don't want an answer to why we occupy. They ask, but they do not want. Doesn't reflect a position of solidarity, the question. Notice the question does not reflect, does not embody a position of solidarity. They prefer to point out the absence of a plan or to have one finally at long last in order to reject it. Media commentators, which you should always take in small doses, cannot understand that such clarity of purpose is not desirable from an insurrectionary perspective. From an insurrectionary perspective, we understand, I think, that the energies of everyday people, when they fracture and they break up the repressive conditions of everyday life, they are not meant to be clearly grasped. These energies are meant to be obscurely beyond anyone's grasp. I'd like to take this farther. We should never, I propose, conceive of and defend ideal end states. I love to read the utopian visions of anarchists. Some of my favorite books contain those visions, but the time for utopian visions is over. There are many reasons for this, I think. Some of them are historical. Others are just a matter of principle. One of the worst things that has happened to revolutionary movements is that after the revolution, they claimed themselves to be the end, the end of revolution. For now, let us just observe that every state of affairs can be better. And to dream of an ideal end is to dream of the end of revolution. Let us dream instead of the beginnings, not the ends of revolution. Now, some may wonder, why revolution? And this perhaps could be a converse, the conversation that we'll open up onto. It's, a, it's an open conversation of why revolution. Not everybody in the occupations or in solidarity with the occupations, some of you may participate in some way, is interested in the question of revolution. Some say it is impractical. You know when I hear people saying that revolution is impractical because all we have to do is take money out of elections? I wonder who's the dreamer. When I hear people say, why are you talking about revolution? All we need to do is elect somebody new. I think they are the dreamer. They have an impractical plan. I've never heard anything less practical than that proposal. Well, why revolution can be answered? Why revolution can be answered in a very simple way? Because we object to the existing conditions. Because we have an understanding of the macroeconomic reality. We can look at it from the most conservative sources. The OECD tells us, an organization of free market, free market people, how income inequality in the United States is greater than anywhere except for in Chile and Mexico. We can look and we can look at the UNDP, the reports that come out of the United Nations, and we have an understanding of this macroeconomic reality, which is increasingly bleak for most of the world's people. We understand also alienation. We also understand the alienation and delirium of everyday life, among other problems, included but not limited to sexist, racist, ecological, and we can continue and add to the list. Can the current expression of disaffection that is taking the form of occupations can it be fully, fully gratified within the limits of capitalism? I think not. I think whatever happens in the coming months or year, I do not think that the generalized disaffection is, that is now being expressed can be gratified 
within the limits of capitalism. Capitalists have been speaking of a fair capitalist society since the 18th century. When industrial, when we didn't even have mass production coming up yet, it was the late 18th century. It was late 18th century when we started to see the beginnings of the hundred years known as the Industrial Revolution, the period of industrialization. And you know, Marx was watching this when the, around the time that the term was coined, Industrial Revolution, and he came up with a word for these people who always spoke about fair capitalist society. He called them apologists. And he called their discourse the discourse of apologetics, by which he meant that for them, it had nothing to do with the political economic structure of society. There's a bad apple. And was Marx some old, is he some old dead man who should, well, haven't you heard who's responsible for the economic crisis today? Ben Bernanke. One man, a villain. No, of course, the economic system can have no causal relationship to the economic crisis, right? It's just a bad apple. Ben Bernanke, yes? Barney Frank did it. That's the man who did it. Yes, the economic crisis is, is, is caused by a person who wears pants. This is, if I dare say, um, well, you know what it is, okay? This is apologetics. And apologetics has existed since the 18th century, and there was a form of apologetics for every setback of free labor. But now we have roughly 250 years of hindsight. And with roughly 250 years of hindsight and growing disparities around the globe, it is perhaps time for us finally to acknowledge the possibility that all meaningful conceptions of fairness will either impede or directly contradict with the logic of capital. The logic of capitalism. There is a very simple way of defining the logic of capitalism, and capitalists all agree. It is to accumulate capital. If you find a person who is not interested in the accumulation of capital, then they do not call themselves capitalists. It is, it is an irreducible part of the etymological and conceptual history of the word capitalism that its logic means the accumulation of capital. And when you find capitalists who don't accumulate capital but lose it, political scientists, we have a technical term for them. We call them not very good capitalists <laughs> because very good capitalists accumulate it. That's what they do. The logic of capitalism is to accumulate capital. This is non-controversial. Certainly, in capitalist societies like ours, fairness exists in gradations. Of course, there is more or less fairness in different capitalist societies. And of course, if we live in one, we should want more rather than less fairness. We should perhaps even fight for it. There is sometimes, even in the same capitalist society, different parts of the society that are more or less fair. But if we work toward optimal fairness, if we are really interested in fairness and optimizing fairness, it is only a matter of time. It is only a matter of time before we run up against the logic of capital itself. Endless accumulation, now more than ever, is the heart of capitalism since we've seen, since the late 80s, a program of policy deregulation from GATT to NAFTA to the World Trade Organization to the FTAA to the CAFTA. It goes on and on and on. This neoliberal regime is not... The interesting thing in our society is that the neoconservatives are also neoliberals. Um, endless cumul accumulation follows a different logic, the logic of growth and private ownership and wealth, than the logic of fairness. The logic of fairness is centered on equality and the common good. Finally now, well over 20 years after the Cold War has come to an end, it should now be non-controversial to observe that most of the world's formal institutions of power are capitalist. Even the ones that the 
press in the U.S. calls socialist are capitalist. There were socialist philosophers who spoke of the Soviet Union in the 1940s as capitalist. In the 1940s, they called it capital, bureaucratic capitalism. They called it bureaucratic capitalism in the Soviet Union, and what we had was free market capitalism. So we can no longer pretend that capitalism has nothing to do with present global miseries. And in this room, I am glad to say that it doesn't have to be made a long-winded argument. When I went to the Occupy uh, demonstration, I saw signs that had the word capitalism on them, which in the U.S. is very important. Don't underestimate the importance of this emergence and this moment. The occupations, I think, this is why as a philosopher I would never make recommendations to social movements. As a philosopher, I look at social movements and I allow them to advise me. Good philosophers, I think, I hope, learn from social movements. They don't teach social movements. The teaching is the other way. It is the occupations, not the political philosophy, that criticizes capitalism. It is the occupations that have forced a return to the question of capitalism in this country for the first time since the late 1960s. A revolutionary perspective is indispensable because it does not only observe the catastrophe of existing conditions and it does not only condemn them. A revolutionary perspective insists on obliterating the conditions that give rise to the inequalities we address. And as I suggested earlier, and I'm almost finished, but as I suggested earlier, we shouldn't look forward to the ends of insurrection, but rather to their beginnings, to the multiplication and continuation of insurrection everywhere. The multiplication and continuation of insurrection everywhere. I remember watching the press speak about Egypt, and they said, we have to keep the verdict hold the verdict, because now they have a military regime in Egypt. They got rid of Hosni Mubarak, but they have a military regime. But you know where the people of Egypt are today. They are in Tahrir Square once again. Because the problem of a transformation is not the transformation. It is that yet another one needs to come. Yet another one needs to come. And we don't need to tell the people of Egypt that. They know. They tell us. This conception of the eternal recurrence of insurrection leads me to consider Nietzsche's idea of the eternal return, which gave me the strange inspiration for the title of this article. And I now want to explain it with a quote first from Nietzsche and then a final short word at the end. Nietzsche's famous uh, aphorism from the gay science goes as follows. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you in your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a god, and never have I heard anything more divine? The question in each and every thing, Nietzsche says, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight? Yes, so this is Nietzsche imagining that when it's all over for each of us, it all begins again. <laughs> and you have to live the same life over and over and over again, hoping for those occasional moments of joy and ecstasy and fulfillment, but having to do, you know, math again, uh, and having to have your heart broken innumerable times more. If you are a mathematician, my apologies. <laughs> now, if you read Nietzsche... You know that political questions, and especially those that are interested in collective action and revolution, find little guidance in the works of Nietzsche. 
You know, the rebel, though, finds solace and inspiration in his words. But when we speak of collective action and revolution, Nietzsche was not our friend. So the quote may appear strangely out of place, perhaps misfit altogether. But to plunder the eternal recurrence for political theory, we might pose his question this way. For how long will we have to fight against all forms of anxiety and material loss and suffering in our increasingly precarious everyday lives, all for the sake of some tre tremendous moment or historic and triumphant breakthrough? But such breakthroughs always leave much to be desired. Perhaps Obama was one such breakthrough, yes? Uh, always leave much to be desired. If we could not see an ideal end waiting for us in politics, and we had to do it all over again, my question is this. Would the insurrection be the dreadful part? Would the moment of revolution when we came together and we expressed our disaffection, would that be the dreadful part of our lives that would make us gnash our teeth? and curse the one who made us do it all over again as a demon? Or isn't it perhaps exactly the other way? Isn't it the everyday life in between every insurrection that seems the nightmare, if not for you, because you love your job, okay, good for you. But is, not, is it not the case that the everyday life in between each insurrection that is the part that is the nightmare for far too many people here and around the world. Isn't it the insurrection itself that is the tremendous moment or the breakthrough that human societies seem to desire once more and innumerable times again? Thank you. So now the main event. Yes? People are hesitant on that. Uh, I would like for you to flesh out a little bit more about revolution and the upcoming 2012 election. And uh, that's all. That's pretty much all I care of. Shall I take maybe a few and then because, um, and, and by the way, the questions are not only for me, right? They are for all of us. And then you had a question, yes? Um, earlier you said that people were trying, like earlier, like years ago, like in the 19th century or something like that, uh -huh. you said like people, capitalists were trying to create a fair capitalist society. How does that work? <laughs> I have a question for you. If I can ask you a question, who are your parents and have they written a book? <laughs> okay, now I would like to have a conference with you to show me how to make that happen. That's a beautiful. That is a beautiful question. Let, let, let's take a couple more. Yes. Okay. Um, from an environmentalist perspective, uh, talking about capitalism had a good long run, didn't it? Uh, so we got a we got a finite planet. Actually, we have infinite uh, energy resources, but let's not talk about that right now. We got a finite planet with an economic system based on infinite growth. Okay, dur. Now, so for the last couple decades, people have, theorists have been, economists have been writing about these transition economies into green, sustainable economies. I mean, that's kinda, that, that's all I got to say. Uh, maybe, uh, could, could, should we should we take the, if we don't if we don't take the three maybe we'll lose them 
Should we take the three and then and then we'll get we'll get everybody else? Is that okay? I don't have to leave, but maybe you do. But can, can we just answer? The, let's address these three and then we we'll go, uh, and then I'll go right right to you after. If if that's agreeable, let's do that. Um, I would say on the on the question of the relationship between revolution and the 2012 election, is that there is virtually no relationship whatsoever. Um, and uh, I think you know that the, uh, uh, the, the 2012 election is uh, possibly a danger because there are already a good number of um, attempts to co-opt the energies of the Occupy movements and to redirect them into the 2012 elections. Now, on a certain level, this makes me nervous, but on another level, it doesn't make me nervous. And the, re the level on which it doesn't make me nervous, I think, is perhaps more interesting because everybody, I think, understands why it would make one nervous. Why it doesn't make me nervous is because if Obama was really gratifying the concerns of us, <laughs> then we wouldn't be here. And so um, the, the fact is that... Uh, there may be certain attempts to bring the election cycle together with the insurrectionary, my hope is they will turn insurrectionary uh, energies of this movement, but I don't think that that will happen. On the question of capitalism and fairness, um, you know, uh, I I'm sorry, what, what, what is your name? You asked the question, capitalism? Yes. What is it? Devin. Devin? Yeah. I mean, the thing, the problem is, Devin, is that uh, the longer you live, the more you will find that our society tries to convince you that the two things, capitalism and fairness, are perfectly compatible. Your insight right now is, uh, is the right one, I think. How could it be? Well, first of all, um, as uh, it's Mary Ellen, yes? As, as she raised, capitalism has had a long run and fairness hasn't gone away. In fact, it's been exacerbated by the most conservative measures. Okay, the only way you can make a case that that isn't true is by cherry picking some national data, you know, within a very, but when you look at it on a global aggregate sense, it's absolutely impossible. So I think your insight is, is right. Environmentalism, I think, is a, is, is, is a it, many environmentalists have, in my opinion, um, been at the forefront of, of, of sowing the seeds for a new critique of capitalism. Um, and they were the ones who said, um, much far before the occupations, that we have to be concerned with the sustainability of a growth model. And capitalism cannot exist without a growth logic. It is a growth system. And the reason why we entered into an economic crisis in the first place, is because there was an expectation for 3% compound growth rate in the economy. And when you have less than 3% compound growth rate, you have what's called a crisis. So if you have uh, the environmentalists, um, James O'Connor, many others, they have said, look, capitalism is, is going to create a crisis um, of sustainability. And now, so there, I think the environmentalists are were very prescient. But the problem is, is there's a whole other environmentalist discourse, and it's the one that I think commands more of the country's attention. And that is all of this, quite frankly, bullshit about how we can reverse the tendencies of the growth model on, on the environment by buying compact fluorescent light bulbs, shopping with canvas bags, uh, driving a Prius, um, you know, eating organic, recycling. The fact of the matter is, is that the, the, that the people who deforest swaths of rainforests in a matter of weeks are not consumers buying groceries. They are large transnational corporations who, um, you know, whether or not their buildings are run with compact fluorescence doesn't have anything to do with the way that they deforest. So, I think that the critique needs to be deeper than it typically is in mainstream environmentalism, but I understand that there is much more radical stuff out there. And Richard, you even mentioned, um, you know, measuring this growth, and I know China tried to measure their capital, their natural capital, and when they started to measure their natural capital with their GDP, it went, like, totally in the red, and then they just stopped counting it. 
you know, and they're like, we're not going to look at that anymore. We're not amassing capital, as you say. We're destroying our <coughs> natural capital, and at a far rather rate than any other kind of value could even be construed. So thanks for that. Um, um, two comments in relation to the questions before. Um, in relation to the 2012 election and with the idea of revolution, I think one of the important things to keep in mind is the idea of the two-party system and with not just looking at that and staying with the system of the two-party system and also looking at third-party candidates, not that they should be co-opted, but also it's more of an opportunity to look at that. And also in relation with the environmentalist question, um, I was reading statistics on the growth of the planet and actually I can't remember what year it would be by, but I think it was like by 2050, if the population continues at the growth that it's at right now, there won't be enough resources on the planet to keep everyone at the state they're living at right now. Uh, all right, my question. I guess I'll give a little history. I was recently at a left-wing conference or called the left-wing school, and there was a environmental conference, and their idea was to show us what could our future look like? What could we do? So they were trying to redraw the maps of cities, you know, based on sustainable sustainability, community gardens, so forth. And I said to them, you know, how, how are we going to make this happen? How do you, you know, how do you make people step out of their comfort zone and do that? And they just, they look like deer in headlights. But then days later, I was reading uh, Communist Manifesto and saw that Marx basically said that before an anarchist society could exist, there must first be a dictatorial society which creates from an environmental perspective, you would basically have a dictatorial society that would force the sustainable cells and so forth and the new city layouts and the changing of things. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Let's get other people's, not just questions, but also other people's responses to other people's questions. And maybe at this point, I, I, I still will say things if people would like, but I can also just serve as kind of uh, discussion facilitator. Yeah. Um, and then we'll go this way. Back to Nietzsche or Nietzsche. I'm not sure what uh -huh. your pronunciation is on that. I'm, I'm a big fan of his works. <clears throat> and on his work, uh, The Genealogy of Morals, he, go, he touches on how virtue and how we perceive morals began, the genealogy of it. And he, he, he talks about how the notion of fairness, the notion of pity, the notion of Charity is all detrimental to the survival of a world based around domination, and he in that with capitalism, you know, capitalism is, you know, you're on your own, you succeed or you fail, and we're not going to intervene either way. And he seems to kind of support in that work. I kind of question him in that work that, because he seemed to support the sort of domination style of the way the world works, and I think that relates to capitalism in a very prominent way. He said somewhere that part of revolution is to elect new people. If that's the case, how do we break the condition already set that people have to vote to party system in, this is the way you have to go in order to go for a third party or independent route when electing new people or even new ideas. So how do we break um, the Pavlovian classical conditioning sense and how do we start and revolutionaries? Let me, let me just make a clarification here. I, I did not say, um, unless I was uh, temporarily inhabited by another being, <laughs> that I did not say that, that, that uh, electing new people is a part of revolution. It may on some level relate to people's sense of the viability and desirability of revolution, but I think it's very, a, a very diffuse relationship. It is not clear. It is non-concrete. Um, the third party thing, you know, in this country, just going back to the third party, because these two things are related, I was, I was very much involved in New York with the Nader campaign of 2000. And I, uh, you know, I, I knew that it was impractical. Even then, I knew that the Nader campaign was 
less practical than a revolution against capitalism, okay? But what did we say to ourselves in 2000? Exactly this, 15% matching funds, 15% matching funds, like a mantra to the point where, you know, we actually were more convincing ourselves than the people we were handing out leaflets to. But um, the third party thing is, is not unimportant. I think it's a major part of the uh, political conversation and, the, and, and trying to wrench open the narrowness of the political conversation in this country. But I also think it is a kind of um, black hole into which people's energies can fall and never recover or climb out again. <laughs> you know, I really feel because in the US, again, uh, running Green Party candidates in popular elections, I would say be practical, just make a revolution. Okay. Um, if, if you have a direct response, you can make this hand signal rather than the conversation going all over the place, and then that way you kind of already have a stack. Um, I know we talk about capitalism, and it seems like it's an evil word, but then you think about a person like Steve Jobs who uh, you know, brings a lot of creativity, and that's what capitalists concept originally meant. I think we confuse it with greed. That's a human trait. And that's what's going on today is the greed that the capitalists, once they accumulate, can't do away with. Also falls into what Pete said earlier about Nietzsche and, and you know, talking about, um, you know, the, the power and the will of power. And that, that's just part of uh, Nietzsche's uh, philosophy of, of what man's destination is. But, I mean, I look around here tonight, I see a lot of capitalist items honing in on you. We probably, most of us drove here tonight. And we're mostly, we're highly dependent on this it's a system that we're, it's a great system, too. I mean, it was the better, we're the better one in the world, but it's the greed, the human, um, you know, nature that, that's overtaking the system, a good system, and good intentions. And the growth is probably limited now. You know, like you, you hit on it. It's, it's the growth that's got us in, in, the, in the problem. And I see a lot of this people here of that age that you hear that you are unemployed. And, and so there's going to be, um, you know, concern. That's why the movement started. It's good. That's how we have change. But we still have to have gratitude about the system. I mean, there's never, there's never been a better system that I've read about that's better than the system that we're living in. If we if we're going to change it, you, know, we have, you and I have talked about this, but uh, we better be careful about what we're hoping for because you may not be able to come back to what you had. Oh, yeah. Let's get some other people. A lot of people want a response. Let's get other people's response. Thank you. Um, well, to you, and uh, one of the things I found we talked very interesting, and I'm really glad that you came. Right. But I get a little nervous when when you start talking about not, it sounds like you talk about not having goals. And I think that isn't what you mean because I personally am a, a strong believer in having and, and knowing. There's been a lot of research, you know, like in social change theory and um, Ryan, F, Ryan F. Esler and all the, that huge group. Um, about how uh, this paradigm that we're living under, and this kind of comes to what you're saying, is that it, it isn't just the systems. I mean, the systems are broken. Okay, the systems are broken, but it goes. I think it does go beyond the system. Um, but I think it's actually the paradigm under which the ways in which we organize and think about things and how we interact with each other. And maybe that's what you meant. Start to feel better. Maybe that's what you meant by like a perpetual revolution. If we start thinking instead of, you know, there's this end result. There, there are things that we want to accomplish, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but, and I think there are some things that probably we could all agree on. Like, I've, I've never met anybody who has been able to defend corruption. Anybody from any group who can do any. Not one strident Republican. If if there's that strident, the, the, they'll just walk away. If they'll start saying things that don't even make sense and they look stupid and they stop talking. 
uh, they, they don't have anything to, to say when you get to that point. So I really think there are some things we can unify that have results. And, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I do think that we need to think of life as more of a process, something always happening. And that there isn't, like, we have some ultimate state. Um, I think, is that what, you're, what you mean? That, there, that we need to think of life as a dialogue and that we shouldn't come to some con conclusion that we get here and we've got it made, or we, we're here and this is how it's going to be, and now we can just sit here and watch TV, right? Mm -hmm. I, is, is that what, it, what you're saying? It's not exactly, but there are other people. If we can maybe, I, I will. I would answer it. It's not in the process part. Are you, are you oh. making a process part? Wait. On the, uh, 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 on the gentleman's comments, you know, about Steve Jobs, and I mean, you can't say anything, you know, as far as him as a person and his philanthropy. I mean, it's awesome. It's great. But I think you need to look at how he makes his money. You know, and that kind of goes to your comments um, that you know, okay. where is there a better system? Our system here works so well because it's built on top of a bunch of people below us that are basically fuel for the system. I mean, right now in uh, China, workers at Apple plants are being forced to sign non-suicide patents because they are killing themselves in such vast amounts to make products for rich white Americans generally, you know? Um, so I think, you know, there are definitely levels of gradation in the, how predatory capitalism is, but in the end, it's based on exploitation. There has to be someone below to feed the system. And here in America, I mean, we have all these great, all this great technology because it's being made somewhere else on the backs of someone else at work. But I asked you, what system would you then recommend? But as he said, I mean, we don't know. If we put out a solution, then we're going to shortchange ourselves from the beginning. I mean, I'm not denying that we may have to go through a few more steps of different gradations of capitalism before we could ever have something that isn't capitalism. But if we say this is what we want, we're completely leaving out of the picture something we're not even thinking about. And I mean, especially with Occupy, we're only three months old. The parties who have their, per you know, the Democrats and the Republicans who have their perfect bullet points that are so media friendly have had over a hundred years to get those. And we're expected to come out with something on the same level within three months, and that's just ridiculous. I mean, I kind of think that our goals will come as we each put things in that we feel passionate about. Um, for me, for example, I, we've been talking about teach-ins, talking about teach-ins. They weren't really happening, so I reached out to people like Dr. Gilman Opowski, who I had a relationship with, and we started doing them. And I think that you know, as the members of Occupy put their efforts into things that they're passionate about and work for, you know, a future that they are that they want will start to meld and will start to become something. But until we give ourselves time to work, you know, the kinks out, we can't go. No, you're absolutely right. That, that's how, and I think that's how life uh, expands. That's how capitalism came into beings. You know, at you know, one time it didn't exist, so you know things do continue to evolve. I, I agree with you 100, but I don't think I think it's the greed factor, the human nature, the corruption, the things that we can't avoid. I mean, but as people, I regardless of the system, I've had a criticism of the greed mantra of the 99 of the Occupy. And it's not, I mean, greed's an easy thing to say. That who's going to be like, oh yeah, greed's good, especially when you frame it with the word greed. Greed is, you know, self-interest, which we all have. It's not something that can be eradicated like we're asking. And so I think if we want to talk about greed, we need to talk about greed as being removed from the, as the core value of our society, you know, and all of that. But uh, as far as, you know, with the capitalism idea, you know, Capitalists, we've talked, we shouldn't have an end state. And everyone seems to be in agreement on that. Except, generally people think, oh, what could we have except capitalism? That sounds like an end state. That sounds like a, you know. I think you missed my point. What I'm saying is, can we stop the bank? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know there's a difference between capitalism and greed. What's the difference in the definition? I mean, it can't shed some light on it. I think it's like. I think pure capitalism. Uh, to respond to this gentleman, I think you're laying out your point as capitalism and then greed. 
but I think it's the other way around. I think greed is what created capitalism. Why do, why do you say that? Oh. Why do I say that? Because capitalism is what can I consume for myself? More and more and more for myself. It's about stockpiling what you can as an individual. If capitalism in no way allows for charity or for social structure, which would include everyone around you. It's about what each individual can do, whether it's through hard labor or not, to appease themselves in their own lifestyle. I would say, though, that with capitalism, that would be pure capitalism, though capitalism, I wouldn't say at its heart, is entirely evil, but unchecked capitalism is. I would disagree, but I'm not going to carry on. So people have to me. But I think the, the real issue here is what we've talked about. Capitalism is based on getting capital. When your root goal is to further what's in your pocket, like the amount of money you bring in, like Richard said, your root goal is not going to then be fairness. But if we could go back to the original point, what I wanted to comment on is the notion that creativity can't exist in a system unlike capitalism. Um, if we're going to say that the problem with capitalism is greed, and greed is human nature. I'd like to say the problem with capitalism is that it is greedy, but it also, it, that we look at it as the only way to find creative solutions. And I think that all of us sitting here, the fact that we're sitting here says that's not the case. There are creative solutions that exist without capitalism. And I think that the worst possible thing to do in this situation is to question and say, I'm afraid of what might come out of this, and what are we going to do that's better than this, and give me a better solution. The fact that we're sitting here together means there are creative solutions that can be found, and what you want to do is not embrace your fear, but go toward yeah. those solutions. The fact that we don't know what they look like yet, to me, is fantastic, because if we knew what they looked like, they'd look like something that has already failed. So, in my opinion, <laughs> in my opinion, I think the, the main problem with that original s statement was that creativity can't exist without capitalism. Because I think we're clearly evidence that it can. Ah, uh, very good. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Should we? Uh, did you have a point of process? I think so. I'm not really good at the and stuff, but. Um, <laughs> Christianity, what it means to one person means something totally different to somebody else. Um, I have a very humble family that all are entrepreneurs on every side, um, aunts, uncles, grandparents, <coughs> on side, all into their version of capitalism, which meant come up with the idea, provide wealth for your family. And by well, I don't mean squish everybody, rape the earth, or anything like that. I just mean work hard and get somewhere with it. And so, the, I just think that word's spoken right up. That's it. <coughs> it's a little bit shorter than uh, capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist, patriarchy. <laughs> um, on, the, on the topic of having goals in a revolution, uh, it's, like you said, it, it's, it's impractical to, to give them a goal to reject. And if you've read the book, Animal Farm, you see a pretty good example of that where it's sort of general unrest, general disaffection taken advantage of by one party and directed in a whole direction not desired by the people that are in disaffection. So when you're in, when you're during, a, during a revolution, you should have ideas and sort of values to strive, to strive for, but also be cautious of where that can take you. That's... Should we, can I just ask, should we, should we maybe go to people who haven't said anything yet yeah. first so yeah. that we make sure yeah. that people yeah. get, don't get seconds before someone hasn't had a first? Right on. Yeah. I, this is a question specifically for you. Okay. <clears throat> because I, I know you're familiar with this. <coughs> now, everyone in the room is acquainted with revolutions that happened and then became something bad. <clears throat> France May 68, though. 
10 million workers go on a general strike. Students are barricading the streets for a month. Sounds good. And then there's an election called. De Gaulle is reelected, and it all dissipates. No, you're wrong. May 68 never ended. Look at French political history over the past 40 years. When one of their elected officials fucks them over, they're in the streets again. They have a different political culture than we do, and it's not just 68, it's 1871. They had the Paris Commune before they had May, June 68. And this is what I mean by emergence and re-emergence of disaffection, is that whatever went away with de Gaulle never really went away. It's just like the situation is said. It's underneath the surface. Our ideas are in everyone's head. One day they will come out. Movement and you know before uh, I'll tell you what, come back to me later. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who hasn't said anything in the back, please. You know, one of the most uh, well known quotes by President Douglas is that without struggle, there is no progress. And I think a corollary of that is that without demands, there is no progress. And uh, I think that that's been shown by all the revolutionary movements in history that make demands about land, bread, and, and peace, land, bread, and peace, and freedom, uh, demands against slavery, etc. The Occupy movement itself here in Springfield has had demands, reasonable demands, against the, uh, uh, against the tax breaks for the, for the rich and for the corporations, because those demands expose the system. And those <coughs> demands that expose the system also transition people's consciousness to something better, something more. And so I think it, it's important to uh, have demands that crystallize the, the intent of the movement and, uh, and raise it in its uh, raise both the political consciousness, etc. For example, I mean, what are some of the core things that, are, that have been driving this movement, at least initially, in terms of student, students not being able to pay off their loans, in terms of workers not having jobs, in terms of people's homes being foreclosed, why not seize bank assets to make sure that, that all, and cancel all the student loans and cancel the foreclosures and create jobs. I mean, there are all kinds of demands that may sound unreasonable, you know, all kind, anybody can formulate demands. The question is, uh, can a movement really be successful without demands? And I don't think that there's any evidence of that. I, I would say also on this question about what is our view about a better world? I mean, everybody here apparently agrees uh, to one degree or another that there are, are fundamental problems with the capitalist system. And perhaps many people here would uh, agree with the proposition that foreign working people having power is a better situation than the capitalists having power. That is usually known as a, as a system of socialism. Uh, so I, I just want to leave that as, a, as an idea to think about. Uh, you used the word uh, obliterate. Um, could you elaborate a little on that? And also, um, we're here in the seat of government and kind of uh, segueing from what the gentleman before said, basically I feel like we've been begging for crumbs from the same people who would beat us over the head with the billy club if allowed. So it's like, oh, please, can we have like a little unemployment? And meanwhile, who are we begging from? Our government. I mean, so that, that's a big dichotomy to me. I mean, we, we have to become the government. We, we are the new system. If I could, on the last two gentlemen, I think, I know at least I mean, that's all there is. But as far as, for like, when you see me as a capital campaigner, I mean, that's all there is. And as far as, like, when you see me as a capital drop in a I don't think it's going to change their vote. And I, I mean, I care if it changes their vote because of how we have to live currently. But I'm there because it gets the word out. And it, it gets people to start thinking. And then maybe they will come you know, to the place where they come and visit teachings like this, or come hang out with the occupiers, and might get to that revolutionary place where they're currently not. So when, I think at least for a lot of us, when we seem to work within the system, there are some that want to work within that system, but I think for the majority, it is about the education and the knowledge that we're putting out to the public. Uh, to bring them, you know, more in line or 
educate them where we're at with what our greatest demand would be. I do want to respond to, to what Jeff said, and that is, you know, I, uh, on the question of demands, because I think that there are de facto demands that arise in the course of struggle. You know, for example, in, in Oakland, in the ports and all that kind of stuff, Oakland. wow. Yeah. You know, I mean, there, there's something that develops organically from that. But I actually think that the point that you, that you raised earlier about uh, the Occupy movement, should we have like, uh, you know, like a, a, a platform? You know, and, and that's where I think that there's a difference between the organic demands that come out of struggle and the demands that you put on a piece of paper and say, this is what we stand for. Because I have a feeling that once we start doing that, we're going to start fighting with each other. And I'll give you a couple examples of what will happen. The first thing that happened, or not the first, but among the first things that happened is that somebody will say that we have to criticize Israel and that we need a two-step, uh, a two-step, uh, uh, two-state solution. And somebody else is going to say, no, we need a one-state solution. No state solution. Uh, no state. And you know, it's just going to go on and on and on. Once, and, once, and right now, the beauty of, of the Occupy movement is that if you've got a gripe against the system, this is the place where you want to be. Now, at the same time, that does not mean that there aren't a necessity for other forms of organization. You know, forms of organization where it's important what your position is on whether or not to vote for Obama. Where it's important, what, you know, how you see the battle against imperialism. It's, you know, that there are important things. But that's not what Occupy is about. We take up the struggles that are sharpest in our area, that we have some kind of a, a power to influence them, and that we go on from there. I don't know anything about There's a couple of people in the back yeah. who haven't said anything at all. Um, so Andrew. can I just, yeah, Andrew, and then and then this gentleman. I, I don't know your name. Alan. You, you haven't seen Alan and Andrew haven't said anything yet. Um, Alan, you want to let me go? Um, that's like my question is. Uh, I think it was Anna. I couldn't see who said it over in this area, but I do kind of agree that capitalism is kind of there's a danger of talking about like it's a boogeyman to a degree, like. It obviously has some good things to do. I mean, I just don't believe in binary. It's either all good or all bad. So I guess my question is maybe it's just coming from an optimist. Um, how much of it is just entropy? You know, like nothing is sustainable. Like buildings are sustainable. What is, I, is it, can I, can I uh, address that question? Because yeah. I, I, I wish I had before Kevin left. Yeah, yeah, the story is <laughs> that. Oh, yeah, that's, 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 please, that's please. That's Revolution is a necessary and fitting for any system. Uh, you know, so I guess how much, obviously, capitalism is more of an agitator to sustainability um, in a lot of ways, but how much would you say is specifically capitalism and how much of it is just, our founding fathers wrote the Constitution before you could destroy the world with a push of a button, you know? Like, well, if I could just quick, yeah, this, this is something I, I, I do think has to be addressed. Because I think you're the second person who said that we don't want to cling to the question or the concept of capitalism um, and that maybe too many people, I think you said, cling to it. Um, but a million, there are a million different ways to see it. The problem is, is that capitalism has been the boogeyman mostly because it's been hiding in the dark and we haven't been talking about it. So when I hear people say, when I hear people say, Everyone's talking about capitalism. The first thing I want to know is where have we been living in a different country? Because when people talk about the economic crisis in this country, it is distinctly unlike the conversation in Greece, the conversation in the UK about pension cuts and retirement ages, where they actually are talking about capitalism. We are not. There is no one in the political parties who are talking about capitalism, not even the unelectables, the Dennis Kucinich's who, and, the, and the Ron Paul's. So clinging to the question of capitalism, I think, is far from the fact of the political discourse in this country. The thing about good things under capitalism, I completely agree with you. There are a million good things under capitalism, but if you look at them, they are the least capitalist things. Now, what, you know, but let me just say this very quickly, if I may. Look, we have relationships with each other that are not governed by the logic of accumulation. This meeting is not governed by the logic of accumulation. 
your family's organization, if you have a good one and you love them, which I know takes some time sometimes, <laughs> is not governed by the logic of capital and accumulation and growth. The growth model, which in fact has been historically, I mean, people talk about something went wrong somewhere down the line. Let's look at the founding fathers. A very mainstream political scientist, Charles Beard, wrote a classic book, An Economic Interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, which shows very clearly that capitalism and the interests of capital were a part, you could read the Federalist, Federalist Papers and you find that there was one founding father who liked the idea of democracy, John Taylor. The other ones were pretty hostile to it. So the point I want to make is, look, it's not some indictment of our whole society, but it is an indictment of a particular logic on which much of the economic activity in this society rests. So don't mistake that when I critique capitalism, I'm critiquing your parents. Or that I'm critiquing, um, you know, small businesses or whatever. The question is that look how much of what we love does not is not organized by the logic of capital. And what we need to recognize, we stop. We have to stop giving credit to capitalism for when we treat each other nicely. We have to stop giving credit to capitalism when we show solidarity to one another. It happens in a capitalist society. Yes, that is true. But it happens against the logic of capital. The first moment of resistance occurs when we express love with one another. And we are not competitive, but cooperative. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a really good YouTube video, uh, The History of Stuff. Like, Story of Stuff. Yeah, yeah, the story yeah. and stuff. Oh, yeah, that's, that's just funny, just how, how, how we end up being these uh, energy cells of consumption, at, you know, feed, feeding the feeding the, the landfills and whatnot. But it's, it's, um, the capitalism we're probably, we're probably against is a lot of the, the wrongs of, of capitalism. The, the corporations that, that go out there, create power outages, and then so they can jack the price up to, to consumers for their poor service. Uh, you know, there's a possibility that BP may have intentionally did, did the oil spill and, and just to clean it up for, for revenue purposes. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of things wrong with capitalism. Uh, uh, there's I mean, the odds are stacked against us a lot of times, just as the average consumer, being the average consumer, in that uh, businesses go out and they, they uh, use focus groups, they use us as guinea pigs, see what we will eat and what we won't eat, what, and try what we consume the most of, and McDonald's is a prime example of that, and they, they, they get us in there and they, <laughs> buying the stuff, buying the stuff, and we, we can't help it. We're, we're, we're like, we're like, we're like, I don't know, yeah. we mice to cheese or whatever. But, but it, it, we can all cook. We can all cook and buy food, and but but that doesn't serve the corporations. The, the more, the less we do for ourselves, the the more more they can serve us their stuff and turn, make a little bit of money on it. So, uh, uh, and, and maybe maybe our, our goals are to have a, a, a better future for our kids and and live live, live a little bit better. You know, confront, confront some of these demons that, that like crisis and capitalism that, that's occurring. You, you haven't said anything yet, so. Part of the problem isn't just the greed of the people who are the upper crusts of capitalism. It's the apathy of the people on all the other levels yeah. who allow them to string us along with the products they make, and we're lazy, and it's oh so much easier to go to the grocery store and buy the crap that you can purchase there than it is to grow your own food or to work with the people next to you to make make things for each other so you don't have to purchase from these expensive big corporations. 
It's our own apathy that gets us to this place, not just the <laughs> greed. Yeah, good point. I'd say also on the, <clears throat> on the other aspects of things, yeah. Uh, we talked about the accumulation of capital, but there's also the, you know, uh, when someone says, I feel used, you know, it's, and, and everybody knows what that means, but we have that embedded in our language in the form of the word employ. I mean, French, the French for employ is to use, mm -hmm. right? But we are a society of employers and employees. <laughs> uh, you are the hammer with which I will beat this nail, mm -hmm. you know? To the thing with Ryan Elsler is that we're a society of, based on competition and dominism. And we view things, a lot of things, one of the, the other big evils in society is that we view things as winners and losers. You're on top or you're on bottom, right? You are, you're either. No non zero sum. This goes back to capitalism. A lot of the people we think of as capitalists. <laughs> they would rather make somebody lose than make money. They care more about causing someone they don't like or have decided is their enemy pain. It is not the desire to have more. It is the desire to make someone else lower. It is not about um, having more stuff for some of them. It's about being on top of the, t the tower, on top of the pyramid. And that goes, I mean, that, that gets, they can use capitalism for that. But they can use other things for that too. It's you know, this mindset that somehow that they can make their life better by making other people's lives worse. And they are wrong. They are just wrong. They make their lives worse. They make other people's lives worse. Because we are not animals that live that way. That is not how we yes, evolved we to live. They we are not tigers. We did not evolve separately from each other. We, we evolved. Our brains became intelligent through empathy. So that's why when you look at egalitarian societies versus, I don't know, us, they're happier and we're more, we're sicker, we're more miserable, we have more crime and we have more problems. Mm -hmm. uh, Drew, Drew hasn't said anything yet. So. Yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> personally, I'm not finding this conversation too helpful. Not because I disagree with anyone. I don't mean to insult. It's just because I think we've all agreed on the what. Now, I want to start a new thread of conversation, dialoguing the how. And, and what, because we all have many opinions and we could all you know, speak on them tonight if given the opportunity. But I have a two-pronged question. Since we all, I think we've already figured out the content of why we're here and what we're trying to do, I would like to figure out the process. And the two-pronged question that I have for you, Richard, and everybody else, but I would like to hear you speak on this, um, is that we've all agreed that we need a revolution, a revolution being defined to me as a complete change. <clears throat> a complete break and change from what we have now. What is it going to take yeah. for the world, to wait up. not just America, not just one country, not just one city, but the entire world to wake up to that idea that we need a complete change? Yeah. And what will it take in their eyes, do you think? What is it going, what, are, what will have to happen for everybody to decide this is fucked? And we need something different. Excuse my friend, I know the children are here. My second part of that question is also having to do with how we go. When you reach the point that you feel that revolution is necessary, the traditional tools of revolution have been the knife, the gun, the bomb. Right? These are the tried and true methods of revolution. As a 21st century revolutionary, as somebody that wants something different, what do we have in our toolkit as revolutionaries right now 
that we can avoid political assassinations and bombings because they haven't begun those on us. I haven't seen those against the Occupy movement. I haven't seen the level of infiltration that COINTELPRO represented, you know, and, and the type of antagonism towards us. What can we do that avoids those traditional methods of revolution? What tools do we have in our kit to go about creating a different world without relying on traditional violent methods? What would a nonviolent insurrection be composed of? Well, I do have a full sheet of things I wrote. I wrote down, but it's become illegible. So, I, I, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to just say a few things, and 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 let me. Um, and so, I'm not going to do all of that, but but let me just try to do a few things here. Um, the first is uh, <clears throat> on the question of demands that was raised. I think your name was Jeff. I heard, and I, I don't know your name. Um, I didn't know your name, Lar. Yeah, yeah I. I, I wanted to just clarify uh, the point that I wanted to make, um, and that is very similar to what you had said, and I don't know your name either, uh, but when you said that demands um, emerge as a part of the process and development of, um, of, of this expression that we are collectively engaged, and I think that is true, I am not suggesting a moratorium on demands. I am not recommending a moratorium on demands at all. But the first thing that Drew said is the first thing he said I disagree with. And that is that we all already agree. We have a small room. This is a big turnout for an event like this. But this is actually a small group. And I can tell you, we have some people in this room who are anarchists. Well, this is a nice, beautiful room. I love this. But OK, but look, we don't agree. We don't agree. We've got anarchists in the room. We've got reformists in the room. We've got people who are, want to see like a democratic left. We've got people who want to work on the Green Party. We've probably even got some Marxists, I hope, in the room. So we've got a bunch of different, different occurrence and trajectories in this relatively small group. So if you, I'm not suggesting a moratorium on demands, but I want to think of them as nodal points in an organic process that get articulated as they become practical and possible to leverage. Because if you want a piece of paper, you'll have your piece of paper, but you'll have a fraction of what you see around you in attendance. So I think that demands cannot be uh, prioritized in a kind of conventional way. Now this goes to the question of, of, of how. Uh, one thing I would say is I think that the history is not quite right. I don't think that uh, violence, on the question of violence, a number of things. First of all, um, as early as before Marx was writing about united fronts and rev political revolution and justifying political violence, there was a French anarchist, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who said we need a social revolution, which is not a political revolution because it's about the transformation of the consciousness of peoples, which the tool was writing. The tool was discourse. The tool was not bombs. The, I mean, the, the anarchists have been misrepresented. It's amazing to me that the, the, the people who have vilified the anarchists, it's long stopped being just the Marxists, okay? It's basically everyone, including some anarchists, <laughs> don't, uh, they vilify the own, their own position. So the, there have been other tools. Uh, when you think of social revolution, for example, bombs don't change people's minds. They clear a space, they change certain things, maybe infrastructurally, but if you want a true reform in ways of thinking, that happens discursively, it happens because we make realizations, because even though we live in a world where many of the features are intolerable, we have become accustomed to tolerating the intolerable, accepting the unacceptable, justifying the unjustifiable. So when you finally see people starting to not tolerate that which they know is intolerable, not accept that which they know is unacceptable, don't rush to the question of demands and what to do next. Because look, for 30 years of, of Mubarak rule in Egypt, it was difficult for the, many of the people of Egypt, many of them were critics of Mubarak. And in Tunisia, we had Ben Ali. But 
It was hard for them to imagine that the world could be something other than what it was. But it could be. And that realization, that psychic break, that shows us that it is possible that the existing state of affairs is not necessary, that we can change it, is a major part of the how. It's a realization. Now, the tools, I would suggest... The Frederick Douglass comment on struggle, of course, he does say, D Frederick Douglass did say struggle, struggle, struggle was the answer. Marx said struggle too. For Marx, the way, the whole of history was nothing more than struggle. But I think struggle is overrated. <laughs> Who really wants to struggle? I do. No. Nobody really finds some kind of great joy in struggle, some great pleasure in struggle. And when we start to speak of the how, we have to be careful not to stipulate models of collective action that will give us no joy, that will, will burn us out, that we will participate in, and then one day say, I did that. I think the tools today are our talents, that people have a multifarious and diverse set of talents, and we need to find ways to put them in the service of a radical political project. We need to find ways to put our talents and our desires into the service of transformation, transforming the world. Some of you can write, some of you can speak, some of you can paint, some of you can make films and edit them beautifully and all of the rest to take out the bad parts, right? <laughs> some of you have all kinds of skills. The question for us is how do we channel our desires into a political project? Because here has been the problem of, of revolution, I think, I think, Drew. The problem of revolution has mostly been this. That we can all think of the world we desire, but we all would not desire to do what it takes to make it. We have to make the tools our talents so that it will, for once, become desirable to make the world that we desire. And you say it's impossible, not you, anyone personally, but think of this, Time Magazine, not exactly some radical newspaper, <laughs> when they were covering the Egyptian rebellion, they had a uh, cover story called The Ecstasy. And the pictures in the story called The Ecstasy were pictures of people in Tahrir Square who were in, making a show of solidarity with each other they were showing each other that we are in this together. We are not isolated in our homes. We can come together and reclaim this space. And it gave them great joy. And it felt good. And sometimes people say, ah, oh, you just go to the protest because it feels good. Good. <laughs> Demonstrating has to feel good. Politics has to feel good. I want to see a world where it is desirable to make the world that we want to desire. Now, here comes to the other part of how. And this is just a general, a thin answer. It's not very specific because I think if we get too specific, once again, you have the situation where you have paper but no people. Sometimes people say we have no power. We have nothing. All we have is, look, it's so small. It's so little. The state is big. Capitalism is everywhere. It's pervasive. Everything is so big. But here's the thing that we need to recognize, I think is that we have enormous power. It just, we just need to realize it. If we stop, at, here's how powerful we are. We could bring the entire system to a grinding halt in three days by doing what? Nothing! If we did nothing for four days, everything would come to a grinding halt. It's happened before. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to do nothing. It takes a lot of work to do nothing. It takes a lot of work to do something, too. <laughs> right? You got to convince everyone else to do nothing. This yeah. is the hard part. The this is the hard part. Happy to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, once again, uh, we should trade places. But <laughs> I mean, no, I think I think you're 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 absolutely right. And people sometimes do have these moments of recognition. You know, the the May June thing wasn't the only time the world saw a general strike. Okay, and the the problem is is I think the frustration for us in the how Drew 
is that we want to know what we can do to make something happen because we feel like we want to organize something and like plan something out and then do it like uh, four days from now at 4 p.m. Right, we, we can't. And this is the, this exactly right because if anything isn't private property, it's an insurrection. So we need to be ready. We need to talk to each other. We need to do all of the wonderful non-capitalist things that we do in a capitalist society like this. Voluntary, cooperative, and by the way, yes, communist relationships that are based on a communal spirit, a Gemeinwesen, a community spirit. This exists even though capitalism has tried to set us against each other, to compete with each other, to beat each other out for that last job that's almost gone. But when we realize there isn't enough, or when we realize that the scarcity is the result, is manufactured, then we can come together. And we can't, the how is the most frustrating answer because Drew, you want to do it. Here's the fact, you can't. You can participate in the Occupy movement when the disaffection of people across this country reaches a point that it creates, I can't just talk about revolution and insurrection any Friday night. I've been talking about revolution and insurrection for 15 to 20 years in everything I do. This is the first time, and it's because of what you already did. So I thank you for that. Yes. this cohesive world union, I was thinking about something I read the other day, and that is, you know, we are the 99% of this country. But in the, in, when you look at world standards, the 1% of world income, the people who are the 1% of earners, is $34,000 and up. So, I mean, we can't expect that people who are who don't have a, a, a roof over their head um, or any kind of safety or security to be in a place to, 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 to try and, well, I can't say that, because they can, they and can, they did. and they did. But it's very difficult, but we're, you know, we're all in those different places. I mean, we're pretty petty bourgeois here, you know, we really are, and, 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 we, we can't just throw this thing that we have onto other people and accept, ex expect them to believe and, and move. You know, when, when, what was it, October 15th, or I think it was October 15th, but was that the one? When we had that demonstration here, there were Occupy Wall Street protests in over 800 cities. Was it 800? Over 800? 80, 80 countries, I think. It was, it was massive. And there's no Wall Street in Springfield, and there's no Wall Street in Africa, but they were occupying Wall Street in Africa. So the thing I want to say is, look, when the Tea Party was happening, people in other countries looked what was going on in the US, and they got very confused. They said, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Because they're talking about the Boston Tea Party, and this guy's an elected president, and it was so confusing. There weren't solidarity protests for the Tea Party in Africa, but there were for the Occupy. So I don't want to celebrate in any naive way this energy. I just want to say, don't take it as a foregone conclusion or take it for granted. It's here, and it's historic. And history is made by people, everyday people. Sort of back to, back to apathy, um, I'm a junior in high school, I go to high school, and um, all I see is apathy. And even Steve Jobs can relate to this because no one plainly gives a shit. You ask anyone and they'll say, yeah, the economy's bad, and they won't, they won't leave their Steve Jobs iPhone. You know, they, they're entertained. Entertainment is the ultimate supporter for apathy. Everyone is so entertained and distracted from just on how, how unhappy or disaffectionate they are, that they don't care. It doesn't affect them immediately, and especially in my generation. I see a generation 
my generation, even the generation ahead and behind me, is a generation of apathetic, uneducated fools who show little hope of promoting any sort of change in the future. And I really want to change that, and I don't know how. I've done speeches, I've done everything, and people just think I'm weird. People are always saying, people are always saying, people are always saying the young people of today are worse than the young people of yesterday, but the young people of yesterday didn't occupy Wall Street. And my inspiration comes from, now I know what you're, I, I, I don't want to write off what you're saying. I think it's, it's a real problem, and I think you're absolutely right. Okay, I think this is real. It's pervasive. And I think it's, and what you're dealing with, you're talking about is a real problem here. Um, you're here, and you're not alone. Um, I'll actually need your help for this, because I don't remember the author, but uh, the people you're talking about are confusing life with survival. They're confusing living a fulfilled life with going every day to work and getting their paycheck and surviving. And it's the media and it's the oppressive work schedule it is, and it's, you know, like you said, the I, the trinkets and the iPhones and the computers and all of that, it, it's a massive system of distraction. Yeah, they have, they have yes. shows where you can watch other people's lives. And mm -hmm. so who was that? Raul Vanayam. Raul Vanayam uh, discussed this. Um, and we talked about him in a class and I, that really, is, I think that's really important, you know, to differentiate between living a, surviving and living a life that you can deal with against, you know, living a life and trying to get what you want. You know, and as far as, you know, what you said with the year in high school and, you know, you giving speeches and all that, I mean, keep doing it. I went to a small town school, our county had 5,000 people, I was constantly, art, you know, in fights with the administration over anti-Iraq, anti you know, protests that yeah, we did, they, all, you know, early when I did all kinds of different things like that. So, I mean, keep doing it. There are people in this room, you know, who are like you, who have had these same fights, and, you know, people like Richard Lewandowski and Mike and Silla, you know, in the back, who have been doing this for decades on end. So, um, keep it up. Yeah. Uh, just a few points. Number one, I want to say for your age, I'm amazed. You've read Nietzsche. You pay attention to politics. So. I don't want to open a huge can of worms for you. I don't know how easily it can be explained to those who haven't maybe read your book. But I think a lot of the apathy may be due to the spectacular idea of capitalism that these people think it's okay just to play with my phone and ignore those crazy occupiers because one day I'm gonna land that $80,000 a year job and I'll be just fine. Yeah. This has always been my fear, Richard. I've, with my observations with various political parties and social movements, they come together, they want to do something, and then there's either a break off or a schism. Mm. What do we do as an Occupy? Because like you said, we have various backgrounds. We have Marxists, we have socialists, we have Greens, we have whatever in here. How do we still reinforce this without causing a schism five, ten years down the road? Is, I mean, is that, do you think that could happen? And if so, how do we just reinforce everyone here to keep going without schism to something else? Now, I think the question is, in a way, it's impossible because I don't, I, I, if somebody were to tell me what path to take to prevent some kind of a conflict in a movement five or six years down the road, I just wouldn't believe any answer they gave me because we're human beings and we're extremely complex and our relationships to each other are sometimes very transient, sometimes are extremely complicated and changing all of the time. The only thing I would suggest is, and this is going to sound like the least philosophical and perhaps the most sort of classical leftist thing, this is the most classical leftist thing I'll say, solidarity. And what solidarity means is that it's those who are unlike us 
that we must stand with. It is those who are different, who face different struggles and who articulate the struggle, their personal struggles in different ways than we would ever. If solidarity means anything, it means that we stand with them. That difference is the source of the problem that you're raising, that you're asking about, but that difference is also what makes solidarity necessary. Solidarity is possible, and I would suggest that maybe the reason why we're all here tonight, even if some of us are Greens and Social Democrats or anarchists, are just curious, okay, um, is the fact that we, 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 we understand the importance of solidarity. We understand the importance of solidarity. And, and you are not alone here, and we are not alone in the world. As many as you see around you here, there are, there, we are everywhere. We are everywhere. Directly to what he's saying, he was talking about Surreal Square earlier and the solidarity that those people are showing. These are Christians and Muslims who typically in fight with one another very heavily who have said, we're coming together over this. We are together because this is a greater oppression than what else we have to worry about. On point with that, I remember seeing, um, I think it was from Time, there was this picture of these Muslims who were uh, praying in Tahrir Square, and there were these Christians who were crowding around them to uh, help protect them. The Muslims did the same thing on and the Sunday Mass, and then on Friday prayer for them, uh, when the Muslims had Friday prayer, they would surround each other to protect One thing that I would, uh, kind of in connection with what Chris asked about the spectacular nature of our society, uh, one thing that I have really taken from uh, discussions with you is the idea that philosophy doesn't guide revolution, revolution guides the future philosophy. And you kind of hinted at it in uh, your remarks in the beginning, but uh, if you could discuss more about that, how you know we shouldn't look to ideology to guide us, but... Uh, we should look at ourselves as creating a new, the philosophy of the future, the philosophy of a society that will move forward. Uh, let, me, let me just make that my last remark, which is not to close the whole session, but at least to close my contribution for tonight, because um, I've talked maybe far too much. But the, 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 the thing that Chris is asking about is um, a, a particular view of philosophy that, um, that I developed in, in a book um, that we discussed uh, briefly for a moment. Um, and that is this, that as a philosopher, I understand philosophy at its best to be a process that raises the most profound questions about the world in which we live. I understand philosophy at its best, and admittedly, philosophy isn't always at its best, to be the process that raises the most profound questions about the world in which we live. And it seems to me that professional philosophers, people like me, do far worse at philosophy than people like you. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm saying what I'm saying, I don't know all of you, but I'm saying, I'm speaking to, I'm speaking to what, in my aspirational conception, is a movement or a fragment, or a piece, or a representative part of a movement. Movements raise questions. Thomas Hobbes writes, Thomas Hobbes writes about sovereignty. But the people of Egypt and Tunisia raise questions about sovereignty that cut to the core. You can read about capitalism and democracy in a million books of philosophy. But when they go on a general strike in Oakland, the questions really get asked. So what I am suggesting is that um, as a professional philosopher, I identify the place for real philosophy in spaces like this, in the streets, in moments of rebellion, in moments of insurrection, when people stand up and say, ya basta, enough. There is the beginning of philosophy. We are all philosophers. 
And we are raising the most important questions now. Let's demand answers. Let's demand the impossible. Thanks for your patience.